the Kabbalah Center is a tax-exempted religious organization based in the United States that was founded by Philip and Karen Berg in 1971. Philip Berg is now deceased, and the organization is run by his widow, Karen Berg, and one of his sons, Michael Berg. Uh, most notably, the Kabbalah Center has uh, riveted public attention because celebrities are involved. That is Madonna, Donna Karen, Ashton Kutcher, Demi Moore. And when an organization has celebrities involved, it attracts a lot of attention. The Kabbalah Center has also generated considerable controversy over some of its practices and behavior. One of the things that has drawn attention in the press and generally in the media is the peculiar practices of the Kabbalah Center. These practices, which are done for profit, uh, have drawn controversy. That is, the marketing and the selling of things through the Kabbalah Center that seems to benefit the Bergs. So this is an organization that has a long history of bad press, complaints, and allegations that it is a destructive cult. The organized Jewish community has never really acknowledged the Kabbalah Center or the Bergs as being authoritative or credible, either as an, a Jewish organization included in Jewish federations and recognized by uh, synagogue associations, nor have Kabbalistic scholars uh, recognized uh, Philip Berg in his original writings or subsequent uh, publications by the Kabbalah Center as being relevant and credible to the scholarly community of Kabbalistic uh, researchers. So what you have in the Kabbalah Center is really more like the Berg Center, uh, which is dedicated to a philosophy that was put together by Philip Berg. Uh, in my opinion, and I, and I speak as someone who has uh, sat on national committees for the Union of Reform Judaism, worked for Jewish Family and Children's Service, and taught for the Bureau of Jewish Education. And I've been invited to lecture about the Kabbalah Center, particularly by Jewish federations in the United States. I have received hundreds of complaints about the Kabbalah Center from former members, from affected family. I mean, this has gone on now for 20, almost 20 years. I, I launched uh, uh, the website database now known as the Cult Education Institute in 1996, and the complaints began flowing almost immediately. Uh, I've heard from uh, people who are estranged from family members who are active in the Kabbalah Center. When they raised questions about a loved one's involvement, they became estranged. Communication was cut off, and they were not, no longer considered to be, as the Kabbalah Center says, in the light. They were in spiritual darkness because they questioned the Kabbalah Center. And on that basis, the Kabbalah Center has broken up marriages, friendships, and come between families. So I have received complaint after complaint after complaint. And many of these complaints from former members of the Kabbalah Center are about how they were squeezed financially that they were told to max out their credit cards, that they were told, you can put off paying your rent, put off paying your mortgage, and people ended up in bankruptcy. People ended up in horrible debt, and they even lost their jobs because the Kabbalah Center would make demands on particular people uh, that was time intensive. And they would put the Kabbalah Center, that is, as, as their allegiance before their job. And as a result, they were terminated. They lost their job. Their careers were affected. So I have received complaint after complaint after complaint about the Kabbalah Center. At the same time, let's, let's, let's just understand that the Kabbalah has been around for centuries. And I have been doing my work for 30 years. Have I received significant complaints about anyone else studying the Kabbalah? No, but I keep receiving complaints about the Kabbalah Center. And, and I think that's important to point out, that the Kabbalah as a 
area of, of Jewish thought, as an area of study, does not generate complaints. It is a benign area of study for Jewish people and has been for centuries. But the Kabbalah Center, as run by the Berg family, continues to generate complaints. In my opinion, the Kabbalah Center fits the primary three criteria that define the nucleus, if you will, for a destructive cult. Psychiatrist Robert J. Lifton, who taught at Harvard Medical School, wrote a paper, Cult Formation, which was published by Harvard in the early 80s. And he pointed out three primary criteria. The existence of an absolute authoritarian leader that is the defining element and driving force of the group. Uh, second, that the group uses a process of thought reform to gain undue influence over people through psychological and emotional manipulation. And finally, three, that people are exploited by the group. And this varies by degree from group to group. In my opinion, when you look at the Kabbalah Center, the way it's structured, the way in which it behaves and functions, the casualties that it has produced historically, the damage that it has done to families and individuals, you're looking at a destructive cult. Uh, the, the aura of almost divinity that, uh, in, that the Bergs are viewed in, uh, that people in the Kabbalah Center feel that they cannot disagree with or dispute anything that they are told by the Bergs. Uh, this is the same kind of authority that other people that lead other groups that have been called cults seem to have. That is absolute authority. No, no one can really question the basic assumptions of the group. No one can question the demands or edicts of the leaders. And the, that the group is personality driven. That kind of reverence, that kind of awe in which the members of the Kabbalah Center hold the Berg family is what you see typically in a destructive cult. When I have received complaints from people talking about the way that they have been psychologically and emotionally manipulated by the Kabbalah Center, by the Bergs, by the teachers there, it is parallel to what Robert J. Lifton describes, in my opinion, in his uh, thesis regarding thought reform. That is, that these people are being manipulated through coercive persuasion so that the Kabbalah Center will then have undue influence over them. People have complained that the Kabbalah Center is engaged in brainwashing, which is a term in popular culture to describe thought reform or a co coercive persuasion program to gain undue influence. And, and here, there is a pattern that I think can be seen in the Kabbalah Center regarding this uh, type of process. Uh, that is that uh, people come into the Kabbalah Center and they are interviewed, they talk to, they share their deepest secrets uh, of their life with the teachers at the Kabbalah Center. And this is what Lifton, in his analysis of thought reform, calls the cult of confession. So there is this kind of no holds barred, uh, no boundaries confession that takes place between Kabbalah Center students and their teachers and the staffers there, which are called the Hevra, which is a, a Hebrew word for friends. And these relationships are very tight and people empty their, their souls to the teachers. The teachers then, can transmit that information to leaders in the Kabbalah Center, to the Bergs, and also, importantly, to those people that make astrological charts. That information informs the astrological chart that, that then is presented to the member of the Kabbalah Center, to the student, and that becomes compelling evidence of the mystical uh, 
quality of the Kabbalah Center. That is that they have supernatural power, that they have mystical powers of discernment. The student doesn't realize that there is a process going on behind the scenes where information is going from teacher to chart maker to leaders, and they're actually being caught in the middle. Instead, they think that this is a demonstration of the true power from God that the Kabbalah Center seems to possess. And then the Kabbalah Center uses those charts and this process as a leverage point to get that member to do things, to get them to donate more money, to get them to leave someone in a relationship who has critical questions about the Kabbalah Center, to no longer have communication with family that may have questions about the Kabbalah Center. But in the, to the mind of the student, what they're dealing with has this uh, spiritual uh, quality, this uh, authority that it seems to come from God. It seems to come from a higher power. And so in the mind of the student, they're not able to separate out the teachers and the staffers of the organization from God, the Zohar, the higher power. Instead, that line of division becomes blurred. And so in their mind, when they agree and follow the directives of the teachers, of the uh, Hevra, or the friends, the staffers at the Kabbalah Center, and of the Bergs, they are not obedient to people. They are obedient to God, to the light, to their spiritual enlightenment. And this process is brought about through confession and through manipulation. Lifton calls this the cult of confession, and he would call this type of manipulation mystical manipulation in his eight criteria to determine whether or not a group is using a thought reform program. And it's important to note that the reason why people don't leave the Kabbalah Center, even when they're unhappy, is because they are encouraged to have unreasonable fears about leaving. They are told that those people who leave become sick and die, that people who leave uh, lose their soul, lose the light. So there are these fears, unreasonable fears, about leaving the Kabbalah Center. And, I might add, unreasonable fears about disputing what the Bergs say. Uh, they are told, uh, you could die if you disagree with the Bergs. People who disagree with the Bergs end up badly. And they will tell stories to illustrate that point, which become a kind of mythology that is uh, supported within the group. So there is this unreasonable fear uh, of leaving, this unreasonable fear of disagreeing with the teachers, and this sense that the Bergs and the teachers have supernatural power, as demonstrated by their seemingly penetrating knowledge of the individual uh, through astrological charts and through readings, when in fact this whole process can be seen as contrived through the information network within the Kabbalah Center as set up by the Bergs between the teachers and those people responsible for the astrological charts. If you were a student entering into the Kabbalah Center, you would begin to take classes. You would begin to become familiar with the staff, the teachers, and they would talk with you, and you would gradually begin to disclose more and more information about your life. What's going on in your life? Uh, did you recently break up with a, a boyfriend or a girl, girlfriend? Are you recently divorced? Did you just lose your job? Did you just inherit a lot of money? I mean, what is going on in your life? The deeper you become involved in the Kabbalah Center, the more disclosure goes on. And there are no reasonable boundaries. That is, there is no area of a person's life that is immune from questions or inquiry 
by the teachers and by the staffers at the Kabbalah Center. So through this process, as you become more and more deeply enmeshed within a kind of subculture that exists around the Kabbalah Center, you have told them a great deal about yourself. They, in turn, can share that information with leaders in the Kabbalah Center, with the Bergs, and they also can share that confidential information, unbeknownst to you, with a person that will then do your astrological chart. That person will then present you with that astrological chart, and it will have very telling things in it. It will say, oh, this person has recently broken up with their uh, loved one. Uh, oh, this person recently lost their father and inherited uh, a responsibility to the world, meaning a large inheritance. Uh, this person is having problems with their spouse. Uh, this person is uh, experiencing uh, a meteoric rise in their career uh, through this particular thing that is not known to the general public and this thing that has taken place. And the person who is being presented with this chart is sitting in awe. They are saying, oh my, how, how do they know this? How could they possibly know these things unless they have mystical, supernatural powers given to them uh, through God in which they can tell things that no one else can tell, in which they have knowledge, special knowledge that no one else can, can, can share, that I have found a place that has true spiritual discernment unlike any other place on earth. That becomes then the Kabbalah Center hook. That is the hook that they plant in each member that then keeps that person engaged. Because that person is going to continually, as they move forward in the Kabbalah Center, recall the clarity of that astrological chart, the, the discernment that they thought was demonstrated through that uh, chart being done. And they are going to say, that is proof. And the way in which the leaders know my soul, they know my heart, this is proof that they really are in connection with the higher power. But in reality, what it is, is evidence that there is a finely tuned networking of information about students within the Kabbalah Center. It's a networking that exists from the teachers who are sharing information with the astrological chart maker, with the Bergs, with other leaders. And so there is no confidentiality. Uh, and, and in that sense, the student is unaware. The student doesn't realize that whatever I say can be used potentially by the Bergs, by other people in the Kabbalah Center, and that there is a reason that they have this discernment, and it's based on the information that I have disclosed. In my opinion, the people that come to the Kabbalah Center, in a sense, are being tricked or conned. And when I say that, I mean that there is a level of deception. Uh, for example, uh, the way in which the astrological charts are created, the fact that information is transmitted from the teachers to the chart makers that make it possible to draw up a chart that is compelling as evidence of some kind of mystical knowledge, when in fact it's really more like a trick because the teacher has informed the chart maker who then presents it to the student who doesn't understand the networking of information in the group. I don't think anyone that enters the Kabbalah Center understands what really is going on from the beginning. And in this sense, no one that joins a group called a cult understands that that group is potentially unsafe or that it's cult-like. I mean, from first blush, what they see in the Kabbalah Center is people called rabbis, uh, the authority of the Kabbalah, the history of Judaism, 
centuries of, of Kabbalistic scholarship are supposedly there. All of this is really a facade to pull the person in. And that is how many destructive cults operate. The surface is a mask. And behind the mask is the reality of the manipulation and the structure of authority. When people first become involved with the Kabbalah Center, they don't understand completely what they're becoming involved in. And then step by step, spoonful by spoonful, they are fed the Kabbalah Center's indoctrination. And they go through a process of persuasion that takes them somewhere that they probably never thought they would arrive at, a place where they become essentially a, a submissive servant, and in some cases, almost slave-like devotion to the Bergs and their center. That's not something that people initially thought they would be involved in. And the many complaints that I have had People have repeatedly said, I was deceived. I was tricked. Uh, I had no idea what I was becoming involved in, what demands would be made of me, and how this all would turn out. I lost my spouse. Uh, I'm separated from a family member. I never knew that becoming involved in this center run by the Berg family would culminate in that kind of an experience that I would end up broke, that I would end up giving them so much money, that I would lose a member of my family, that I would become estranged from uh, someone I love. People don't really understand how people are exploited by groups called cults. It isn't all at once. It's a bait and switch routine. I mean, this is what I tell you I am, which is all good and wonderful. I'm about the Bible. I'm about solving all the problems in the world through a political theory. I'm uh, about curing people through some claim of science. Or I'm about the Kabbalah, when in reality, it's something else. You, you are baited with this very appealing presentation and then as you become involved more, it's switched out. And what it becomes is total submission to the authority of the organization as achieved through what many have called coercive persuasion and influence techniques to gain undue influence. Karen Berg and Michael Berg are absolutely in charge of the Kabbalah Center. They know what's going on. They run things from the United States. Nothing goes on without their consent. Uh, they are the final arbiters of whatever takes place within the, within the centers. So behind the scene, the Bergs are running everything. And then, of course, there are those people that the Bergs pick to be leaders, uh, to be teachers who serve at their pleasure. I mean, if someone would dispute their authority or challenge Karen Berg or Michael Berg, they would be dispensed with. And this has happened over and over again. I mean, I've, I've talked to many former Hevra or full-time staffers from the Kabbalah Center who found it incredible at how easily they were dismissed and dispensed with when they disagreed with the Bergs. And so when someone leaves, if they displease the Bergs, they are cut off. And they may not have communication, even with a family member, and, and many times with longtime friends who they spent years with in the Kabbalah Center. Is this typical of a, a synagogue, a Jewish organization, a school of higher learning? No. Uh, but this is a parallel to what has been described in groups called destructive cults. That is uh, what Lifton, a psychiatrist who wrote uh, the book Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism called the dispensing of existence. That is when you no longer please the hierarchy of the group, 
the people in authority, you no longer have a right to exist. And your existence is there and dispensed with. And I've heard this again and again from people complaining about the Kabbalah Center, that when they left, they felt that they no longer had a right to exist in the minds or the hearts of the people that still remained in the Kabbalah Center. You come to a point in the road where you're thinking, I, I really want to leave. I want to leave this group. I want to get out. But you reflect and you think, what are my exit costs going to be? Uh, what will be the price that I pay for leaving? And the answer for many people is too overwhelming. I will lose my family. I will lose my spouse. I will lose all my friends. I feel so emotionally invested in this group after years of being involved that I, I have emotional equity in the group. I have given so much of my time and money to the group, I feel I have uh, tangible equity in the group. And so based on that alone, people will say, I don't wish to leave because the exit costs to me are too high. And then in addition to that, there are these unreasonable fears that people are often led to believe regarding leaving a, a, an authoritarian high demand group. They're told, if you leave, you'll get sick. If you leave, you may die. If you leave, uh, no one will ever love you like we have loved you. No one can ever share the light with you like we have shared the light. There is no other group like us on the face of the earth, and therefore, if you leave, where will you go? So there are unreasonable fears that people are led to believe in authoritarian high demand groups called cults. And the Kabbalah Center, certainly in the complaints that I've received, exhibits that pattern. And many of the people stay and stay and stay for years because of unreasonable fears and because of, I believe, the sense that the exit costs of leaving the Kabbalah Center are too high. Uh, the Kabbalah Center run by the Bergs claims that they have millions of students. Uh, I don't know where they come up with that number. Uh, it could be uh, that their numbers are as, as few as, I would say, one to 3,000. One of the most important things to understand about the Kabbalah Center is that it isn't part of mainstream Judaism, and that it doesn't represent centuries of Kabbalistic scholarship, but rather the idiosyncratic uh, beliefs of Philip Berg, Karen Berg, and Michael Berg. Another thing that's very important to understand about the Kabbalah Center is that the people they call rabbis, which is a word in Hebrew to describe a teacher, a rabbi, the Kabbalah Center rabbis do not have the same requirements as rabbis within Reform Judaism, within Orthodox Judaism, the OU, within the conservative Jewish synagogue movement, or Reconstructionist Judaism, or for that matter, ultra-Orthodox Hasidic sects that have a process of learning and ordination which is called a shmicha, or rabbinical credential within the Jewish community. And the Bergs have no particular educational requirements for Hevra that I'm aware of. Uh, they don't require a college degree. They don't require se a seminary degree. They simply require that they perform according to their dictates and to their guidelines. So you have people that they could be coming out of the army. They could be coming out of any walk of life and come into the center, do courses, become involved with the Bergs, and then they could be declared Hevra. They could be ordained by the Bergs and called rabbis. What these honorific, it seems to me, titles mean outside of the Kabbalah Center is, is not clear. To, to me, uh, having worked in the Jewish community for many years and worked with many rabbis and Jewish ed educators, I'm aware of what it takes to be a rabbi, of what it takes to be a Jewish educator. 
And the Kabbalah Center Hevra and the rabbis that they have there, uh, they, some of them have college degrees, but many of them have no particular credential from any accredited university or college or any recognition really outside of the Bergs and the Kabbalah Center. What you have in the Kabbalah Center are rabbis who are rabbis because the Bergs say so. I say you are a rabbi, and therefore you are a rabbi. Because you agree with my philosophy, because you have attended the classes in the Kabbalah Center, uh, in this sense it's kind of its own universe where uh, that which is not a rabbi in the real world is a rabbi within the world of the Kabbalah Center. That which is the Kabbalah in mainstream Judaism for centuries is suddenly turned on its head and becomes something entirely different within the Kabbalah Center. So I think that's important to understand because as people come into the Kabbalah Center, uh, they are in awe of the, the, the centuries of, of, of Jewish history. They're in awe of the centuries of Kabbalistic study. And they are in reverence to these people that are being called rabbis. But in reality, what they are seeing is simply valid within the Kabbalah Center and invalid to the organized Jewish community and the larger uh, culture of Kabbalistic study in the world. Uh, the Bergs are a legend in their own mind, but they are not a legend outside of the Kabbalah Center. And the reverence that is demanded for the Bergs may be exhibited within the Kabbalah Center, but there is no reverence for them in the same sense outside of their centers in the real Jewish community and amongst credible Kabbalistic scholars.